so the next one I want to try is the the bourbon that I'm going to get in a little trouble talking about. But all right, I'm, this I'm is ready to like. get in trouble. <laughs> I'm ready to be not. bad. <laughs> I don't want to talk about how much whiskey I just got on my blazer. <laughs> I think this is an excellent pivot. So uh, what should we uh, go on drink on next? So the next one I want to try is the, the bourbon that I'm going to get in a little trouble talking about. But All right. I'm, this I'm is ready what we to like. get in trouble. <laughs> now ready to be on. bad. Perfect. Uh, so this doesn't have a label on the sample we sent you. Uh, it just says gold label bourbon, 113 proof. That is correct. Uh, so this is the first ever release of ours of a new line within the barrel craft spirits universe if we call the 15 year gray label this is what we call gold label okay uh spoiler alert the label's gold oh um although it, it will come in a now. red box we uh the gold boxes looked really cheesy so we ended up with a with a red box um <laughs> did they uh, did they look like that gold bar company that gold bar if they did company? we would have used them okay <laughs> I, I see that in Benny's every now and then. It, it literally looks I, like a big gold bar. And I'm like, I see it in duty free earth? all the time. And I'm like, I need to learn from the person who represents this brand how they get all of the hardest placements. Okay. Like gold bar is in all of the places that I don't know who to call to even talk about whiskey to get it there. How is it in duty free in like <laughs> Las Vegas? I don't know. Like, uh, but anyways, the gold label bourbon, uh, it's a, 16 to 18 year old blend uh the age statement is not on the front but it is on the back and i'll explain at the end why we decided to do that it was a really okay. hard decision for us but okay uh all of the components for gold label were ingredients at one point in one of the bcs gray label bourbon releases either starting two years ago or last year or this year's release uh and the reason for that is we took one of the components that we felt was particularly lean two years ago that we felt could handle more wood and we put it into toasted oak for two years. Uh, and we were really careful and patient about that because we were really, um, I, again, it's probably off brand, but giving someone else credit, we were really blown away by the original release of the Michter's toasted oak finish. And then we were all really disappointed by the second release. Uh, and trips read on it was like they just didn't leave it in the toast for long enough um that it wound up getting bitterness out of that second virgin barrel and it didn't soften out uh and so we decided if we're going to do it this is not going to be like a toasted oak finish it's going to be a secondary maturation it's going to be essentially long enough to be a, a straight bourbon but it started at 15 15 or 16 years old oh, um, this is opulent <laughs> uh, so this is pretty woody and it's not all toasted oak finished. It's about 25% toasted oak finish, but the blend is constructed to be able to handle that additional marshmallowy toasty wood as part of it, but to incorporate it into it where it's still like a very complete bourbon and not just toast on a, I don't know, what would, what's the, I don't want to say lipstick on a pig. I don't want to make that kind of comment. I don't know. Toast on a pumpkin. <laughs> No, I get it. Like, you know, toast, toasting is so meticulous and we've seen producers do it well and producers, I don't think it do quite as well. And we've kind of battled with that. We've released our first toasted single barrels this year. And like they require a lot more work. Like you have to be on top of it. And the moment it's ready, you have to pull it because toast just like has really interesting interaction. So I, I actually really like that the toast is part of the blend here, but it's not, you know, a hundred percent of the product, you know, cause that adds a whole additional facet to blending. Yeah, essentially what happened with this is we, we made one irresponsibly expensive ingredient. We took something that could have helped us with an allocated item, and instead we left it for two years, lost a lot more angel share, you know, didn't use it and paid for a whole new set of barrels for it, brought it back in and used it to blend something else. There's only, there's a little over 3,000 bottles of this being released, so it's a very, very small release. No kidding. Uh, and the reason that we have the age statement on the back is because it's a 16-year-old bourbon, the oldest being 18, but we have done some experiments with having only the toasted oak component be younger bourbon uh, okay. because we found in comparing that set of barrels to some other experiments that we've been doing that 
even though the whiskey was better old bourbon going into toasted oak, when it was blended with other things, you, the toasted flavor note worked pretty well with five or six or eight year old bourbon going into it for a couple of years. Uh, and we know that our stocks, though deeper than most, are limited with high teens aged bourbon barrels. And so we don't know what we're going to do next year, but I'm not trying to like convince people to hoard these, but this might be the only one that is a true 16 year old. The one next year may be a 16 year old base with a five or seven year old toasted oak blend into it. Okay. Uh, Interesting. But right. I might say so that and then you hoard it and then it might be 16 again next year and then you're screwed. Right. So, you know, well, I don't, know. I don't think you're going to be screwed for the other people hoarding this. Have you, have you, we talked about it in the green room and my, my brain is fuzzy. Have we talked about what this is going to sell for? Cause I, I think that that might fix your hoarding problem. Uh, we're targeting a, a 499 or a $500 price point for this. Okay. With um, only 3000 bottles. So, I mean, I, I don't know as hoarding will be a real big issue with that one, but I mean, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, before go I, ahead. Dive in. I, I, uh, I'm always really careful and hesitant to talk about price point with our more expensive things because I, I don't for any moment want anyone to think that we don't know that that's a lot of money. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, and, and that's where I was hoping you'd go with this. Like, you know, and, and kind of like you, you talked about with the first gray label, you know, $250, $300, wherever it falls in the market, you know, people were haters. Uh, they didn't like it. You know, they had strong opposition and then it sold out and then they wish they could get some. Um, this for me is the boss hog of barrel. And I, I right. think that that's absolutely, I won't say a compliment, like you guys can stand on your own accomplishments, but I really like, and John and I talk about this all the time. I went and bought the 18 year whistle pig double malt rye because it was $400. And when I was ready to buy it, it was still there because like it was actually priced at where the market would have put it. Mm -hmm. And I think that this would do the same thing. You, you know, if you price this at $200, this would sell it immediately. People would flip it at 500. The people who wanted it couldn't get it. And, you know, and sure, $500 is a lot of money, but this is a kind of a luxury product anyways, right? Like no one technically needs expensive whiskey to survive. So right. I, you know, the value's there. Clearly it's not inexpensive for you guys to make. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I haven't given any notes, but I actually really like this probably even over the gray. Um, but yeah, price it where you want it to, you know, and heaven forbid it actually sits around for 90 days. And then the people who have time to go out after the first day of release and pick some up, you know, have an opportunity, which I think is great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and comparing and we'll it really to see, Boss Hog is right. We've never, we've never been in this price point before. So we, as much as I like to pretend I'm someone who has a feel for the market, I really don't, um, in terms of what this is going to do. And so it, it might be a day one, it might be a pre-sold out, it might be uh, sitting around for a long time. Uh, what we are trying to be very deliberate about is we are being clear with our distribution network and also with our key accounts, how much there is, how much is going places, what the expectations of spreading it out will be so that we don't wind up with a situation where if there's a whiskey bar in a city, they, they don't have the opportunity to buy a bottle. Um, because that is, we've learned the hard way with some of the things that have won awards that they don't necessarily go to the people who like deserve them. They don't necessarily go to good whiskey accounts. They go to the people who are, they go to the squeaky wheels. Yeah. Um, and like, I applaud the squeaky wheels of the industry, but as a, as a supplier, as a producer of whiskey, you like really hope that you can get things to the places you want them without, you just like, you want to prepare everyone who might be on the same side as you for fairness. Oh yeah. For the situation. And, and that's, that, that might be the toughest part of the whole supply chain is right. Once your product makes it to market is figuring out, you know, you're going to want 10, you're going to want two. there's some validity to both sides, but, and, and it only takes one botched release to be like, oh, crap, we didn't know that they were going to take 30% of the allocation for this market just because they could, you know. Right. Like, or that, like lessons you learn of like, oh, okay, for this state, we're not going to release the purchase order until we get an email confirming to us back that they read our email about allocation requests. Because it's like, happened once, <laughs> all went to one store, Yep. person didn't open the email. Yep. So like now you don't get the product till you acknowledge to us that you read our advice. I dig this quite a bit, actually. Um, the nose on it immediately kind of woke me right back up, man. Like I was surprised with how much I liked the gray label because last year I wasn't really a huge fan of how Tennessee forward it was for me. Really liked that. And then jumped into this and I was like, wow, this is, uh, 
this is like like i said earlier opulent it's just like just a very rich rich bourbon here this is really nice i think comparing this to boss hog is a really great idea too jay because i mean like you mentioned you don't go buy a bottle of boss hog then hold on to it for three months and try to sell it to one of your idiot buddies for 200 bucks more than you bought it for like boss hog is priced for a drinker to buy you buy one of those you open it you drink it with your buddies you have a good time I could see this being in that same category where it's like that once a year special release of something that you really look forward to. This is um this is nice. What what I like about this one and this is kind of unique too is it's it's big and sweet up front, really big creamy. I noticed that kind of marshmallow fluff sweetness mm -hmm. on the palate, which is fun cuz I I usually get like a little bit of fake marshmallow, a little bit of like toasty caramel, kind of burnt creme brulee on some of these over toasted or under toasted, but um, big like mark. It sounds weird because like fluff is like ninety nine cents a can or whatever people put on a peanut butter and fluff sandwich. But like, really, yeah, like rich, decadent, opulent palate. But then it's got a really spicy finish, which kind of surprised me, and it keeps it from being too sweet. Which is is kind of my beef with some toasted stuff is they're just so sweet from start right. to finish, and and they almost have a aluminum kind of aspartame note on the finish, and I don't get that here, which I can really respect. Yeah, the. Uh, the Old Forest of 1910 for me is just like too much of this like chocolatey, syrupy, marshmallow. And it was like a really cool idea. And I actually like using it as an ingredient in things. I just don't like to sip that on its own because it's just driven way too much by the uh, extreme char that they use and, you know, their whole double barrel process. So a lot of toasted things actually have kind of pushed me away because of that same thing, that toast is driving, it's doing all the work and it's not allowing any sort of balance to come through. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that spice is definitely essential here. Yeah, when we were putting this together, the toasted oak is on one of the ingredients that we, especially for the BCS line and also the what we call the evergreen line, so dovetail are made of seagrass, what we focus on most is setting ourselves up for success by making ingredients, not by making the whiskey from the very beginning. We try to get the ingredients where we want them to be. And then there's the like, how can we make the marriage of these two or three or five or seven things as good as possible? And so uh, we want everyone to get the notes that they like from toasted oak, but it's not really a toasted oak finished whiskey. It's a, it's a bourbon blend that one of the ingredients is a toasted oak finish. Yeah, uh, And I don't know if there's anything else in the market that's doing that right now. I think every other toasted oak finish is like the whole thing went into toast and then. Yeah, I think and that's probably why I dig it so much because a lot of the other things, it is just like you said, the entire thing is a toasted finish and then it just, it becomes too far into one lane and it doesn't really showcase itself very well. And this has a lot more of that balance that I wish some of the other products would bring to it.